Hi, everybody. We knew tonight was going to be a bit of an intimate evening on a smaller group of people, but I think we, but we will still be pushing this information out as far and wide as we possibly can because it is a subject that we are all very passionate about and very excited about. So for those of you who have not been a part of these sessions beforehand, this is called Luke's Legacy Family Research Rounds. Now, where this comes from is actually influenced by um, the life of my son, Luke, who was uh, born with very medically complex as well as disabled. And he was the type of guy who just had an attitude in life that he, uh, that, uh, he should be invited to every table. And that that would just be assumed that there would be a chair for him and that things were just all readily available for him. And that was just a really neat platform to consider in his memory about the fact that uh, it should just be assumed in, in many spaces that we're all invited to the table and that, that this is a welcome space. And we really truly do hope that that is what is felt with everybody who comes to these sessions as well, too. Um, tonight. We, uh, oh, actually, before I, there's one more thing I should add to this as well, too, that this is a part of something called the Family Engagement and Research Course as well, too, which is meant as a larger part of a program that helps researchers and family members actively work together to build quality relationships, not just to be in places where procedures are put together, but where you can meaningfully partner um, as colleagues as well, too, and really do make amazing um, science and knowledge for people who um, who need it and with people with lived experience. And so tonight we are going to be talking about a lot of different types of various aspects of policy and some of them that I have had the privilege and honor of being a part of as well too. And we have some of the coolest people in the field talking about this as well today. So the way the session works is that we have the full hour to um, hear about what's going on, and that is optional up to the speakers tonight as to how long they want to use it and how they engage. But we try to make this a plain language space as well, too. And so if you are a researcher or if you are a parent, we want to endorse the fact that th this is an equitable space where you can share experiences, thoughts, feelings, and even potentially suggestions, depending on what we're talking about. So we, we want everyone to feel like they have an opportunity to speak and things like that. So um, after the hour, depending on how that goes, we have an optional setting afterwards, an extra half an hour, which we like to utilize just given the fact that if you would go to a conference and things like that, you would hear like an amazing speaker and you'd have all this energy and you'd go get a cup of coffee and you'd talk to someone who was there too and you'd say, oh, that speaker was so great. They said this, that, and the other thing. And a lot of times people were leaving with, that same sort of energy from these sessions. And given the fact that we are in Zoom, it makes it a little bit more awkward, but we try to make that extra half hour of space where people can kind of just sort through what they they learned, how that applies to their lives or to their work experience, and just to ask questions and things like that. So for the researchers in the room, this is an entirely optional space to participate in that extra half hour, but you are welcome to that space as well too. There is lots to talk about, I'm sure. Uh, come the end of the conversation here this evening. So by all means, please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat if you haven't already. We want, we'd love to learn where you're from and what brought you here tonight. And I would like to take a moment to uh, pass the mic to the team who will be speaking today and I will leave the introductions to them as well too. Excellent. Um, thank you so much, Rachel, for kicking us off and Rachel and Kinga for having us here today. Um, so my name is Brittany. Um, I'm currently working at the uh, Disability Policy Research Program that's housed at the University of Calgary. I'm joined by um, my boss, Jennifer Zwicker. If she could give a little wave so everyone knows who she is. And also um, Keiko Shikako, who is out of McGill University. Um, and I will share my screen. I was about to dive into my presentation realizing you can't see my slides. So I will share my screen and we can get started. All right. So, as I said, thank you so much, Rachel and Kinga, for having us here today. We're super excited to be um, talking with you all, and we really appreciate you all taking the time to attend. Um, so, we are going to be talking to you today about um, 
how we can influence policy to make a difference for Canadians with disabilities. So this presentation is mostly going to draw from um, our experiences conducting a research study on the inclusivity of COVID-19 policies across Canada. It was a joint study done by the University of Calgary and McGill University. Um, but however, we're also going to be bringing in some of our other work. Um, we're, you know, a big policy research group and we have we have lots to share with you all today. Um, oh, okay, perfect. So the first part of our presentation today is going to provide a bit of an overview about disability policy in the Canadian context. Um, Keiko is going to be doing most of the speaking for this session, but I'm going to start us off with a bit of an activity just to break the ice. Um, I promise it's very low stakes. I'm a person who gets a lot of anxiety about activities in presentations, so I promise it'll be fun. Um, in the chat box, I am going to put a link. Um, if everyone can click on that link, you should get a screen that pops up and it tells you to, um, you don't have to put your name into it, you can just push skip um, and you'll put answers in there. So what we would like you to do is put in um, to this web page. Oh, and feel free to put in the chat for having any issues um, accessing this. But what do you think of when you hear the words disability policy? Um, and we should have a word cloud that is going to pop up. So if everyone can start putting in their responses and we should be able to see the word cloud in real time. Can everyone see the, the word? Can someone just give me a thumbs up if, uh, if you can see the word cloud? Perfect. Yeah, so this is fun. We can kind of see what, what everyone thinks about disability policy and, and see where we're all at before we move into the presentation. So this is great. Yeah, I'm seeing institutions, family, benefits, ignored, effective, viewpoint, rights, um, laws, ableist, families. This, large, this is great. This is really awesome. I see, yeah, barriers, red tape, deficit, um, invisible. I'll give us another maybe minute or two if there's anything else. And then lots of, so the, the cool thing about the word cloud, as I'm sure some of you know, is the things that are typed in a lot become bigger. So we're seeing rights a lot, which is, which is great. Definitely something we're going to talk about today. Awesome. Cool. So yeah, we, uh, yeah, lots of things in here that I think we'll end up talking about uh, rights, laws, families, benefits, institutions, all that we'll get into, but it's great to kind of see where everyone is at on this topic. Um, and I will get back to our slides and I will hand it over to Keiko, who is going to give us a bit of an overview of disability policy in Canada, just so we're all on the same page. Go ahead, Keiko. Thank you uh, for attending for this intro. Uh, hi, everyone. I know some of you in the, in the room. It's really a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much, uh, Rachel and Kinga. I want to acknowledge uh, what a privilege it is. I never, I didn't meet Luke um, in person, but I met him through Rachel in our many interactions in the past year. And I think that the idea of legacy is so beautiful because indeed, and for me very personally, I think I've benefited from Luke's legacy by being able to work with Rachel in a lot of those policy, so-called policy interactions, but much more than that and through life interactions, which are way more important. And uh, hopefully we'll get to, to talk about those today. And I want to really recognize that that's the true legacy, I think for me personally. And um, thank you for that, Rachel. Um, and uh, also want to acknowledge, um, I'm learning, I, I wanted to, to do a, a brief land acknowledgement, but um, I'm learning on that and I want to more recognize that how much we have to learn in terms of um, bringing people together, uh, being an, as an immigrant to Canada, I, I am very, I feel very privileged to be uh, able to work and play and do research and interact with people in these lands that I know are not seated and uh, there has had so much uh, reconciliation to be done uh, and so much to learn. I am in the very beginning of my personal journey towards learning about truth and reconciliation. And uh, I do want to learn more and make a stronger commitment when we're talking about policy. I personally want to just fully admit my um, fails into uh, interacting more and I'm definitely in the learning so I just want to acknowledge that there is much to learn 
before we can even mention policy, there is a lot to learn in terms of how we recognize uh, the, the trajectories, the neglect, the abandonment that has happened in historically and how what's the influence of that in what we're doing here today. Um, lots to understand and learn. So I hope the section is way more about understanding and learning and um, reconciling all of this different fronts where we're coming from than, than a lecture, right? So uh, I, I guess that's the, the legacy piece. Uh, and I think that's what, look, and being part, I love this definition, Rachel, like it's everybody should be at the table and uh, recognizing who is not at the table today, even on discussions like that, it's a big part of the learning in what we do. So um, that also came to mind, even in the word cloud we had before, and with this very definition heavy, um, academic definitions of policy. Um, I, I, I'm, I was seeing the word cloud and think, I think I wanna skip that because we have had so much, when we do the same activity, uh, I, I do the same activity with my students, with OT students, with graduate students, different workshops and opportunities. Um, and what comes to mind, one, it takes a lot more time for students, uh, research trainees, uh, healthcare professionals or training, people training to be healthcare professionals to come up with any words <laughs> related to policy and disability, um, interestingly, right, the definitions, especially for policy, are really, really hard to find, right? So there are groups that have a very uh, different sense of what policies are, and often they will go more in the direction of laws, regulations, uh, um, rules, right? And not what I saw in the word cloud, which is really um, more on neglect, on and, uh, ableism on uh, not being heard. So I saw a lot of people experiencing, and I think that's the different uh, and the richness and the beauty of this table here is that um, we are experiencing policy from different ends, right? And that's important to acknowledge also, even when you think of those definitions that again are based on, you know, some classic definitions of policy. Um, we can see links on, okay, if you take the first one, anything a government chooses to do or not to do. And when we see the definitions that you put on the word cloud, I see a lot of what government or the translation of governments choose not to do, right? But the element of choice is important here, right? Um, how much choice government may have and how much choice that people who are on the receiving end of policies have in relation to that. So that is a clear power imbalance there. Um, public policy uh, can be generally defined as a system of law. So there comes the more traditional definitions of laws, regulatory measures, course of action. So we're doing this, we're not doing that. Funding priorities with a specific topic, right? And usually promoted by some entity with some level of power again, right? Um, and imposed and to and followed by the others. Um, curse of action or inaction. So those are, there's a lot of action into policy. And I think that's the part that we want to try to emphasize in the conversation today. Um, so what public policy, our understanding is will approach that we have for most of the studies that we we'll present are what government, so the, an official institution of government does uh, that has an impact in persons with disabilities and in particular in children with disabilities and families. Uh, please feel free, and I saw the chat. Uh, I am on my laptop, so the screen, I cannot keep both. Uh, but uh, I do, please feel free to jump in and either if you have questions, I cannot keep the chat open because it's, uh, then I can't see the slides. But uh, if there's anything on the chat or that you want to, maybe, I don't know, Rachel, can, you can unmute and jump in. Please interrupt me at any time. I speak a lot, and I'll try to <laughs> go faster it so we can get to the conversation, which really... I think is the most important part of it today. So uh, the next uh, slide, please. So in a nutshell, um, again, don't be shy. Okay, if you have questions, comments, really unmute and, and speak. But what we'll try to talk to today um, is a notion of policies that comes from an international human rights frameworks. Uh, those of you are maybe less or more familiar with it. So there are a total of nine international treaties. Canada has seven, has signed to seven of them. 
and they cover a lot of things, those international treaties. So anything that comes from the United Nations uh, or the WHO, the World Health Organization, and is uh, set as an international framework that has implications for how the count or should have implications for how the signatory countries do or don't do uh, their policies and regulations, right? Um, specifically, we'll try to focus more on the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities uh, as one guiding framework because it has a lot of items that interact with all the understanding of disabilities that we have and the services and provisions that we should have in Canada. Uh, and then Canada being Canada, how we have those three uh, main levels and of jurisdiction, so the federal government, so some uh, institutions like the Public Health Agency that you might have heard about, uh, Employment and Social Development Canada, we, we hear less about, but a lot of the disability policies of the federal government are funded or planned or organized through this um, entity, the Employment and Social Development Canada. Canada Revenue Agency that decides a lot of the funds and supports and tax benefits and whatnot and the legislation, the charts of rights and freedoms and other legislation that happens at the federal level. Then in provinces uh, are responsible, as you, I'm sure you're very familiar with, all the services and structures that are most relevant for most of us on a daily basis. So health, education, all the, that will dictate all the provincial legislation, social services, finances, other types of provincial uh, allocations. And also we have policies that are more um, housed within, well, we have municipal level too, but also supports from organizations that are not part of government, but are peripheral to it, but also interact with it. So nonprofit charities, community organizations and others, right? So that's the structure. Um, and those are the a few examples in uh, each of those spheres and some of which will tap in more in depth and some not. I will invite you right away to, um, we have other resources um, that we are happy to share with you after that don't fit in the, in the presentation, but especially about the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Uh, it's an instrument that has implication for Canadian legislation, for Canadian, uh, the way we see things happening and the claims that we can do in terms of human rights to human rights tribunals. Um, the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child is another one. Uh, UNICEF collects data and supports a lot of those activities, informs government in a lot of actions. Uh, the WHO also has a lot of um, guidelines and frameworks and suggestions on how things work in Canada or should work. Um, for example, the urban health agenda is one item that the WHO is working now, and that will have influences on how we think of cities and health in cities. Uh, UNICEF has recently collected a massive uh, report on a child on children with developmental delays and disabilities, and this report informs national policy. So, and the UNCRPD and the UNCRC are two main uh, human rights treaties that have. Uh, that Canada has to report on periodically to the UN and also have implications for the way we see um, policies being done here. Uh, the federal government and provincial governments, there are some examples there, um, you know, recreation uh, supports and services are way more housed at the provincial governments and that's a problem sometimes because those are the governments that are closer to us. And, uh, but it's also not so connected framework. So that's a little bit of what we're going to talk about today. Okay, so far so good. Okay, um, any questions, any comments uh, so far? We can go. I'm trying to go through the, the so no, if you have anything, just unmute yourself. I can say stop and then I'll stop. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I'll keep reminding that so don't feel shy. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about a project that we did um, over the COVID times uh, that are not totally over yet, I know, but uh, so this uh, is a project we did, uh, so CHR, as soon as, uh, the, the, not as soon as, but at some point <laughs> during the, the pandemic, I had a call for projects that would address needs of specific groups during the pandemic, and that's where this project um, was a response to this. 
uh, and we focused on mental health. The call was for mental health, and we wanted to look how mental health policies, if there were, what they were, the mental health policies supporting the mental health of children with disabilities and their families during the COVID pandemic. And specifically, we looked into these policies in relation to this Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Um, I'll try not to be saying the acronym all the time, but that's for that's what CRPD stands for. Um, and the, the the 33 articles they talk they tap into different topics, right? So the right to health is a big one, the right to family, the right to uh, school and education, the right to participate in the community, the right to have their best interests uh, heard. All of this are, is part of the CRPD. And the policy documents that we collected were policies that uh, were provincial and federal policies. We searched it across uh, provincial ministries and federal government, anything that had a mention of disability and mental health, right? So th that's the criteria. And with that, we compared the content of those policies to the articles of the convention to see how they align as a way to try and understand are these policies responding to these international frameworks? And then what uh, Brittany will tell us more is how they also are matching or not, aligning or not with the needs voiced by the families, right? Um, what we did find, unfortunately, on this was that there was a very limited number of policies that were specific to promote the mental health of children with disabilities and their families during the pandemic. So a lot of the policies that we end up identifying, they were very generic, generic in nature, or they would mention mental health as an issue, something to be concerned, something to look at, but not necessarily um, making explicit what's the mechanism or how this policies respond to the questions of uh, physical and mental health integration, participation in the community, school, not non-specific mechanisms. And that in both federal and provincial uh, policies, sorry. Then, so we saw also there's a lack of clarity in most of the documents in terms of how they, uh, they can be applied. What are the implications, right, for children? How they reflect uh, the things that children need really in the daily lives and their families. And there's a very, uh, there was a lot of alignment. The, the, the most matching, let's say, that we found was with education. So a lot of the mental health policies were really in relation to school services, but in emergency responses, which is expected at this point, and respect for family, but not a lot on health, community services, and other areas that we'll hear later were very important for families. Um, next. So from this study, what we learn uh, in terms of looking at the policies only, right? And then we'll see uh, more what families had to say. We saw that a lot of the services that are meant to support mental health, and even if they were not explicitly saying like this is for mental health, but they were located a lot in schools, right? So it's for school services. Uh, a lot of the services provided for families with disabilities in general are located within the school and not within health. In particular for mental health, which is often seen or too often seen as a secondary outcome, right? So this was a problem when schools closed, right? So when schools closed, when kids could not return to school as fast as the other kids, or even when schools opened, but children with complex conditions could not go back to school. So where the services went, if they could not receive the services at school, they were not receiving services at all. Um, and that's an issue to be discussed. Uh, and that the overall, the uh, mental health policies were insufficient, and we'll see that from families, but what we saw in the description of policies was very superficial, right? Was touching into issues, not, uh, was mentioning perhaps the importance of, so it's very important that families continue to have respite support, but uh, there was no mention of other very important resources for mental health, such as networks of supports, formal and informal caregiver supports, um, and how uh, policies could afford to support those people who were caring for children during the pandemic while also working and maintaining their other activities. And those needs that we'll hear from the families 
where and how they are translated into policies, these mechanisms were really not clear. So in a nutshell, that's what we learned from this study. And um, I think Brittany will now continue. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Keiko. I really appreciate that overview. Um, I'm going to move into talking a little bit about the experiences of families interacting with disability policy in Canada. So we've kind of got an overview of what policy is, how it's structured. It's very complicated. There's a lot going on. Um, so our, um, our team's focus on this study and other studies was to talk to families directly, talk to youth directly, and learn about their experiences trying to you know, access programs. Um, so we can try to develop policy recommendation, recommendations to help make it more inclusive for um, people with disabilities and their families. So, I, oops, sorry. I'm going to be very quickly providing an overview of two studies that we did, both at the University of Calgary. Um, the first study we did before COVID. So we talked to, um, we did an online survey and interviews. We talked to 499 people on the survey, 81 people in interviews. And we talked to them about their experiences accessing services um, within their province. So those are both federal services like the disability tax credit and also provincial services like respite or um, community care or anything like that that they're accessing at, at the provincial or territorial level. Um, the second study is actually the, the objective two of the study that Keiko was just talking about in terms of um, policies during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, during this study, we interviewed uh, youth participants, as well as parenting caregivers, to talk to them about their experiences during the COVID-19 pandemic. So we wanted to learn, you know, how did their life change? What happened to their mental health? How did their access to services change? Just so we could learn how to do better, essentially, um, in the next, well, hopefully not the next pandemic in our lifetimes, but the next emergency that happens um, to be more inclusive. So, sorry. Uh, when we looked at our study about uh, experiences accessing services before COVID, one of the main findings from the survey aspect um, of that study is that 68% of our participants were not accessing the programs that we asked about in the survey. So the majority, which is quite a shocking finding, like there's all these programs available, government's putting money into them and people aren't using them. So we wanted to know why, which is why we did um, interviews with 81 parents and caregivers to learn about their experiences. Um, so on the screen here is kind of a very oversimplified and ideal world trajectory of what would happen if you wanted to access services um, for your child uh, with a disability. Basically, you would recognize, hey, we need some support. You would then learn about the programs, you'd apply for them, and then you'd access them. That is a perfect world. Obviously, that's uh, there's some barriers along the way, um, considering that 68% of our participants weren't accessing programs, and that's exactly what our interviews showed us. So um, we found kind of four main categories of barriers along this path that were preventing parents and caregivers across Canada from um, accessing services. The first being a lack of information about programs. Um, people found it really hard to even find out about the programs that they were eligible for. They found it overwhelming to navigate um, and tr on top of all of their other kind of responsibilities that they had in life. Um, the next kind of barrier along this path was difficulty with the application process. So, you know, lots of paperwork, having to see a lot of different professionals, it could be time, it could cost a lot of money. Um, and it was also a lot of people told us about how when they were rejected for a program, it was very confusing sometimes as to why they didn't know what to change on their application in order to be to successfully access the program. So that was a, a big source of frustration, for, excuse me, for our participants. Um, the third roadblock is people not being eligible. So for various programs, as I'm, I'm sure some of you are aware, you have to have a certain number of um, criteria that you need to meet in order to uh, gain access to the program. And if you don't meet those criteria, you're not able to um, be accepted. But a lot of our participants shared that some of these criteria didn't necessarily reflect reality. So a very specific example would be in terms of income level. Some people would say, you know, my income was too high to access this program, but I'm still having a hard time affording support. So I still need support from this program, but now I don't have enough money or sorry, I'm making too much money to get support. And it was kind of this catch 22. Um, and that was a bit of a struggle for participants as well. Um, and the final barrier being uh, program design and delivery. So what we mean by that is what the government does to design programs. Um, 
so things like, you know, wait lists being really long or programs being cut off at certain ages, those are types of decisions that governments make and they can impact the ability of families to access programs. Um, the good news is we did find that um, an overarching facilitator to being able to access programs was access to quality guidance. So, you know, if people had access to support from their peers, we heard a lot of like social media networks, Facebook groups that help people access programs. We heard a lot about the key um, importance of knowledgeable professionals, so physicians, social workers, accountants that were able to provide support in the application process, um, as well as in some provinces, we heard about support from service navigators that were able to help um, individuals kind of find what they were eligible for and then apply for those programs and, and successfully get support. Um, so that is a, a brief overview of pre-COVID, kind of what the service landscape looked like. Um, during COVID-19, uh, we found that, I mean, sorry, we talked to um, parents and caregivers during the COVID-19 pandemic, and we also talked to youth um, with neurodevelopmental disabilities as part of this study um, to learn about their experiences during the COVID-19 pandemic. So what we found is that, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic obviously had a large impact on, on everyone's lives, but particularly um, on these individuals. The first major impact being that there were denials, delays, and disruptions to services. So I'm, I'm sure many people are aware, but, um, you know, services were discontinued, they were intermittently offered, they weren't consistent, or they were shifted to virtual platforms, which had kind of a varying success among our, among our participants. Some really loved that shift, some really didn't. So there's just a huge impact on access to services. Um, and we also found that a one size fits all approach. So that's kind of the approach we went for in Canada. You know, here's the restrictions, everyone has to follow them. It neglects variability and experiences. And I'll get to what I mean by that in one second. Um, but these impacts had a lot of implications and resulted in changes to the lives of youth with neurodevelopmental dis disabilities and their families. So on the right hand side, I've listed, um, you know, a few of the main impacts of, uh, or sorry, implications of the COVID-19 pandemic. And one thing that I think is really important to note is that within each of these categories, we did find that there were positives and negatives. And the reason I bring that up is just to bring it back to that one size fits all approach not working and the importance of talking to a very diverse group of individuals with different experiences to be able to learn about how policies met their needs or didn't meet their needs and really consider um, everyone's experiences when building policy. So I'll give a specific like kind of illustrative example so that um, you all can understand what I mean by that. So in terms of deconstruction of the social network, um, we actually talked to a lot of youth with disabilities that um, had co-occurring social anxiety that found that the decreased social pressure of COVID was very beneficial to their mental health. They weren't pressured to be socializing all the time, and it was a really big relief for them to have a bit of a, a social break. Whereas on the other side, we did talk to parents and caregivers, and we talked to some youth that had really strong like community connections and they had a really great support system and being cut off from that was just really difficult for them. It caused a lot of loneliness, isolation um, and mental health issues as well. So that's just one way to kind of see how these policies that are implemented, they can be really hard for some people and great for others. And it's just important to take such a holistic approach where we're talking to as many people as possible um, to learn about their experiences. So um, that was a, a very quick overview. I'm happy to take more, I can talk about these studies all day. So we can take questions at the end or now or whatever um, regarding the, what we've learned. But the key messages for me from um, the work that we did was that the first that many families experience challenges when applying for and accessing disability programs. Um, the second being that the COVID-19 pandemic had a really large impact on youth with disabilities and their families. Um, and the third is that many different needs and experiences need to be considered um, when we're trying to develop policy that is inc as inclusive as possible. Um, I've talked a lot. Keiko's talked a lot. We're going to put it to you guys. Um, we would love to hear about if you want to share. Obviously, this is a it's up to your comfort level, but we'd love to hear, you know, do the experiences that were shared by our, by our participants generally align with your experiences? Do you think there's things there's we're missing? Do you think there's things that really resonate you? Like we just love to hear more whether or not you want to um, come off mute and uh, share or share in the chat. 
we would just love to hear more about, um, about, you know, your experiences and what you think about what we've kind of talked about so far. So I will hand it over to um, anyone in the audience that wants to share. Sorry, Brittany, I was going to jump in for a second. Do you want to uh, launch this as a poll? Uh, or I think are you I okay think just chatting. Yeah, I think we can just chat just okay. uh, just in the interest of time. Yeah, right. I think that would be. But thank you so much for checking. So please feel free to come off mute if you have any thoughts, experiences, or things that even resonated with you, um, either as a professional or as a parent, anything as such. We are, this is a safe space and a welcome one. Uh, it's Doug Ford here with our daughter, uh, Madison. I don't know if you can see her there. Um, we've been having challenges with uh, um, positions. Um, some of them see, well, it, it, it's, it's better now, but there are a few specialties uh, who won't see a, uh, a patient until uh, the COVID is over. And so they're still not seeing patients at this present time. That's a very frustrating part of this for sure. Uh, and sorry, Char, if, if you can, so they're not seeing patients because of like COVID, COVID. Because they're over capacity because of what's the, what's the rationale? Um, we're trying to parse that out ourselves. Um, but he's, he won't see anybody unless it's an emergent uh, situation. Uh -huh. um, and it's uh, my daughter's um, GI specialist. Um, so it's a source of frustration for us and for, uh, for my daughter's uh, family practitioner as well. The whole social isolation piece uh, was very challenging for us uh, because our daughter uh, was, is very social, um, but she's also medically fragile. So trying to balance those two, two things um, is, uh, was a challenge. Yeah, we, would you we absolutely. Oh, sorry, Rachel, go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. I was going to say, would you have found early on something along the lines of risk guidance be, being something that would be beneficial? Probably, yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, I, I, the whole world was turned upside down and we were all trying to figure this out yeah, yeah, as yeah. we went, you know. Um, but yeah, certainly risk guidance would, would have been helpful. Mm, okay. Have you found? May I ask you? I don't don't want to put you on the spot, but um, like, have you found any resources that were helpful? Because I, I saw groups creating like for different conditions, different resources, and I, I'm thinking of this now. Like, is this um on how to interact or how to create safe environments for magical fragile kids? in the you know in returning like now that things are opening up and whatnot have you come across anything like that that has that has helped or not really not really i mean right now she's back in her uh, regular day program mm. and um and that's that's been helpful and I, we've noticed that she's starting to come out of her shell like, uh, a lot more now um and uh actually starting to really develop friends the challenge you see was that she graduated from school during the pandemic and everything was shut down. Um, all the day programs, everything. And so she was here at home. And um, just recently, uh, these day programs have started up again. Oh, I just want to give you all hugs, like just everybody in the community if that was entirely possible I just it's something that would be lovely to do but yeah, um, I think oh sorry go ahead no I was just gonna say uh we just have a few more things I wanted to tack on to the end here so um I would but I want to hear from people first and foremost so if there's any other comments or thoughts um feel free to jump off but we're also going to have time at the end to chat as well um but I'm just trying to make sure we get through our last little bit because I, I personally think it's the most exciting, so. 
Okay, I think. I, I just just quickly said so I just want to acknowledge the conversation in the chat like that yes absolutely like I, I agree I think we have not maintained like public safety measures right public health precautions as as you said that could benefit so many of or most or all of the children we're talking about right and uh, and this is something to be definitely discussed on solutions to maintain things that were quickly suspended and that could have helped. Um, way more uh, people returning, right, more safely. But yes, go ahead, uh, Brittany, sorry. No, no worries at all. Thank you so much. And thanks everyone again for, for sharing. We, we always appreciate hearing from people and learning about their experiences. So part three of our presentation today is what can we do? I mean, I feel like we've talked a lot about a lot of problems. There's a lot of policies that aren't inclusive. Like, what can we do about this? Um, and we want to move into kind of some of what our teams try to do um, in terms of solutions. And then we also want to hear from you, like anything you've been involved in, maybe our ideas for you or your ideas for us. Like we just left hope in a dialogue about, you know, how we can move our research and also a lot of these problems into that kind of solutions arena and how we can make things change. Um, so the first thing that we think is really important and it really fits the theme of, you know, this lecture is co-design. And so um, basically making sure that the, the people that we are doing research about are at the table with us um, while uh, we uh, do our research. Um, so for the COVID-19 project specifically, the one that I talked about and Keiko talked about a little bit, um, we did have a stakeholder advisory council, which our very own Rachel Martins co-led and did a fantastic job of. She was amazing. We always love having her on our studies. Um, but basically, we think this is really important is, is bringing, you know, parents and caregivers together, youth together, representatives from different organizations to get as many people together as possible and give us perspectives on our work to make sure that the, the work that we're producing is impactful and as inclusive as possible. Um, so I just wanted to give a very specific example um, of something that our advisory council really helped us with for this project in terms of the interview portion. Um, our advisory council really pushed us to talk with youth directly. It was not something we were planning to do necessarily. We were planning to mostly talk to parents and caregivers. And a lot of them said, you need to talk to youth. Their experiences are different. Like this needs to be something that happens. Um, we had no idea how to engage with them. We had no idea how to recruit them. We were, you know, we just didn't, we didn't really know. And our advisory council was so great. They helped us recruit on social media. They helped us to, um, they really pushed us to think about how we were giving the interviews. Like originally with parents and care caregivers, we mostly did them over the phone or over Zoom. Our advisory council and our youth members were like, a lot of youth probably are going to want like an online option that's more engaging for them. So we made an online option with their collaboration so that more youth were engaged. Um, and I thought like just having their perspective, like there were, yes, a lot of things that overlapped with the parents and caregivers, but a lot of really distinct findings that we never, and experiences that we never would have heard about if we didn't engage with them directly. So this is, I mean, something that I'm personally so appreciative um, with our advisory council. And I think that's why advisory councils are such a great um, thing to have in research. And they just really make the the policy recommendations that we're uh, making way more impactful and way more inclusive of a lot of different experiences. Um, the next thing that we want to talk about is um, the power of storytelling. So um, our research team really believes in combining data and information with stories because stories are impactful. Stories are, you know, they really, they really stick with people. Um, so for this project in particular, we made um, digital stories with two of our participants. And um, it, I think we have time, but I, we really wanted to show you what uh, Keiko and Jen, what do you guys think? Do we want to show one now or just send the link to participants? I think you should show it. Okay. So I'll quickly show um, Sarah's story. Uh, just give me one second to pull it up for all of you. And not getting oh, we're just not getting Brittany. the audio, Brittany. Oh, okay. Uh, you know, oh, maybe I'll take my headphones out. Yeah. 
I apologize. I'll start it over. Okay, let me know if this works. I stared at the one inch stack of paper on the boardroom table. I knew a diagnosis was coming. I just didn't expect so much. Autism, ADHD, borderline low IQ, mild Tourette's, DCD. I'd heard most of them before, but I had lots of questions. How would this impact our life? And what is DCD? A physiotherapist replied, it's developmental coordination disorder, impacting executive function, particularly affecting fine and gross motor coordination. To be honest, we're shocked he's already learned to ride a bike. Driving home, I reflected on how grateful I was that I hadn't known about his DCD four years ago when he spent an entire day falling off his bike before finally mastering it. And I realized that when a child with autism is pursuing their passion, nothing can stop them. As a teenager, seven years later, he suddenly said, I need new friends to get together with. Can you help? He had never shown interest in friendship before, and it was hard to contain my excitement. I started looking for new activities that night. We started with a homeschool art class, and he loved it. While DCD made some of the activities more challenging, his desire for friendship, along with a newfound passion for art, was helping him improve and engage. Then, late one night, we got the email. His art class was abruptly ending because of a new virus called COVID-19. He was angry. I was devastated. I had waited 16 years for him to want to make friends. And overnight, all the new opportunities we had been planning were lost. As a homeschool family, all of our extracurricular activities were in the community, not in the school. So even when schools reopened a few months later, all our resources stayed closed. Even my activities were lost. I'd been doing jujitsu for two years and didn't realize how vital it had become to my mental health until it was gone. I needed that space, those friends, that community to be the best mom I could be for my two autistic children. As the pandemic dragged on, my younger son began to show signs of agoraphobia. One day, as I was going out for groceries, he said to me, mommy, don't die. I realized we needed to leave the house. We needed to be around other people. COVID restrictions had made us feel alone, afraid, and abandoned by society. I called a friend in desperation and arranged to go for a weekly walk with her and two of her children who were the same age as my boys. At first, leaving the house was very hard. When we finally got out, there was little conversation. We had to stop often to catch our breath, and we had to encourage the kids to go off on their own. But we knew it was important, and we kept going out every week. Now, two years later, we're best friends, and the kids are choosing independence. It's great to see that they've each developed one friend during this time. But now my oldest is 18, and I wonder how can I help him expand his friendship circle? I've heard people say, it's just two years. Children are resilient. But there have still been lost opportunities for youth with developmental challenges. It's my hope that in the future, all public health decisions will be made with awareness of the impact on neurodiverse youth and their families. All right. So yeah, in terms of um, trying to you know make that difference, we, we really do think um, it's very important to have pe people telling their own stories. Um, we can, you know, provide the charts and the data and all of that, but I do think there's nothing more powerful than um, than storytelling. So um, another way that we uh, try to influence policy is through engaging with government directly. Um, I'm going to pass it off to Keiko and Jen. They have much more examples than I do of doing this, and I'd love to hear from them about their examples of trying to engage with government um, and influence policy to make it more inclusive. Yeah, so I think this was, uh, and Jen, uh, jump in. We, we were just thinking of a few examples of um, ways that we have had this interaction where we had families and research and government representative working in different situations. Um, so one example on the pictures, I'll start with the pictures. 
And please, uh, anyone jump in, Rachel, you, you're in half of <laughs> those, you're in all of those moments, I guess, so jump in to, to say, but it was just to, um, I think it's to give perspective more so, so it's less on how to use because we don't have real solutions or methods established, but what this started as uh, how can we bring families into the conversation and youth, right? And we had, um, and there was a, this great conversation in the chat going on about also how to engage the youth with intellectual disabilities, with different um, types of disabilities into these processes as well. Um, the first was a picture that we took and that my students sent like, oh, here we're here. Uh, on the public consultations for the Accessible Canada Act. Uh, that was the, the Montreal one. I know others participated all around. And um, that was an example where I, I saw a few families there, but there wasn't many youth and not everybody knew about it. And uh, those were public consultations or not research consultations, right? Uh, that were open to the public, that were ultra accessible. If, if anything that they've done right in this public consultations was accessibility. Uh, including all these accommodations for different types of disabilities, um, all sign languages, uh, uh, anyways, physical and other types of accommodation. Um, the other pictures here at the UN, uh, Rachel was there, like we had work with the ministry, uh, Kirsten Duncan, what was Ministry of Science, and we had uh, Leon, that was great that we could bring one youth and, um, and Susan as well. And uh, when we were doing an event on reporting on the um, on the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and doing a side event with government representatives and uh, to the UN committee. Now, uh, Rachel has had the chance to go to other UN adventures together, but recently uh, we finished the assessment for the National Autism Strategy was another opportunity with multiple opportunities for families and people um, uh, with autism to interact and participate. Uh, we did a project of meaningful consultations with federal government with different disability organizations to see how we can better uh, consult and uh, interact with different groups. And uh, on all the conventions, uh, the reports and on the CRPD and the CRC, we have opportunities uh, for interaction and for participation of children speaking directly to the UN committee, speaking directly to government. Uh, and we've tried to bring those groups in all the opportunities that we have. But that's for sure um, something that we need to spread the word so um, that other families also have access and can interact and participate and engage meaningfully. Um, Jan, I don't know if you want to. Yeah, sure. I mean, I'll just I'll maybe tell one example of a story that I thought kind of illustrates this importance of storytelling and, and kind of families sharing their story coupled with research and data, I think that's often a really powerful um, way to, to approach government uh, with issues um, and hopefully kind of solution-oriented solution -oriented approaches. So uh, we were, we're working on some work around the disability tax credit. Um, I now actually sit on the disability advisory committee for the disability tax credit. So keen to have input on that, keen to, keen to work on that with you, um, but uh, we had a, uh, I was working with a, a family member who had a, a meeting with the, the Minister of Revenue um, and we we're sitting there with the policy advisor for the Minister of Revenue and uh, they were telling their story and you could kind of see that, you know, they were listening politely, but they're kind of taking the approach of, well, this is one story, you know, I've got lots of different challenges to focus on in my portfolio and um, the parent after telling their story, uh, then stopped and said, you know, the disability tax credit is a horizontal equity instrument. There's this evidence kind of backing a lot of my story, which we, we'd been coaching them and kind of giving that narrative. So that was kind of backed by evidence. You can see the, the policy person sitting there just kind of do a double take because they're exactly right. <laughs> um, and, you know, I think and it's not to say, you know, you have to know all the research and go with the research. I think the point is that there's lots of people and researchers that can back a lot of a lot of kind of the work. So I think um, to me that the lessons were it was much more powerful for that family member to be having that conversation instead of me. And um, it was very helpful to have kind of some of the information and evidence kind of backing um, backing behind their story so that it, you know, it's, it's the idea of kind of coupling that digital story with some of the research findings from many participants that I think really brings 
brings the importance and the impact of the work to life. So I think that's always a good approach um, and a good partnership in sort of family engagement and research. I'd agree with you on that, Jen. And I would definitely say that for my experience uh, being in the photo on the bottom there of the slide, uh, when I got asked, uh, part of the challenge ended up being this was beyond the scope of anything that I had obviously ever experienced. And so I ended up connecting with Jen and uh, a colleague of hers and said, so if I, if you were me and had a chance to tell your story, what would you want to put in that? And so I got the most lovely email with a bunch of plain language referenced information about what would be important for Canadians. And I took the time to read it. And I sat in a Starbucks in New York, writing my heart up out, moving that information into my story and my life. And the whole thing ended up being where I shared my part of the presentation and the video didn't work. And so I thought, oh shoot, this was like, this was the big moment. And what ended up happening, it was one of those things where government officials were like trying to rush the minister out of the room. And I kind of went, give me five seconds. I've got something on my phone. And I sat down beside her and I could see these people were very annoyed with me about the fact that I didn't care in that moment. And I showed a video of my son and I may cry because I'm a brief bum, but I don't care, whatever. <laughs> Anyways, um, I shared a video of him and how much he loved the movie Moana and one specific song only because that song was the song of the angels in his mind. And if you weren't engaging to the same energy that he was, and you didn't maintain eye contact through the process, then he would pinch you and as punishment. And that was his thing because he just felt like that was his moment of connection. And that in and of itself was just, it took so much work to get there. And I had that moment to say in that space, this is what happens when you invest in these kids. You have these beautiful golden moments. That's what we are all working for as mom, as parents. And that in and of itself was just a soul injection into a space that felt very, in, in some ways, very procedural and very foreign to me, but that's what I could bring to the table. So I thought I'd just add that to that as well too. I, I love that. Thank you so much. Sorry, Jen, you came off mute. Did you want to say something? Oh, it's just beautiful, beautifully said, Rachel. I just couldn't agree more. Yeah. And that, that actually helps kind of kick off into our last, um, couple of slides where we actually, again, want to hear from you because we've been talking a lot, but, um, you know, and we kind of put together a few ideas for, you know, if you want to get involved in this kind of work, or if you want to engage like things that we thought of, you know, maybe attending conferences, getting involved in research, reaching out to your representatives, getting involved with community organizations. Um, but I actually, and maybe this can kind of bleed into the, the networking portion of this, um, you know, would love to hear if anyone in the audience has been involved in any experiences that they want to share, positive, negative, what they learned, what they wish researchers knew or policymakers knew, like it would be, it would just be great to hear from you all um, about this for sure, uh, if, uh, if there's anyone that wants to share, but that's kind of where we had ended our presentation. Um, I'll put up a slide after, like during the networking part with just ways to contact us if you want to learn more, but um, yeah, I'd love to open it up to the floor if there's anyone that, you know, maybe has questions from before or wants to share their experiences. Um, love to hear from everyone and uh yeah thank you all so much for attending yeah thanks Brittany and one thing I I also wanted to add to that is I think sometimes um and it's sort of to your comment Sue about sort of how how to get politicians or or public servants to care about these issues I think on some level there's also it's also being creative about where some of the intersections of these issues are because sometimes I think as we say disability policy which is, you know, this kind of strange framing of policy, it, it really, you know, the issues span so much more than kind of what are characterized as disability supports and services. So it's trying to be involved in conversations around caregiving, you know, that are going on at a higher level and income assistance and, you know, basic income conversations and, um, you know, talking about national autism strategy as kind of a more um, pan disability type strategies and kind of broadening some of these conversations, I think, so that it's not, we're not, you know, it, the, the issues aren't pigeonholed into kind of specific segmented kind of siloed spaces. And I think often, and in some respects that the age lifespans are re reflected as well, because sometimes we're seeing that, 
you know, children, for example, aren't, aren't kind of represented in some of the conversations appropriately or transition age youth or things like that. So um, that's where I think sometimes bringing those perspectives forward and sometimes what seem like unusual places can actually have a lot of impact for people because they're not really thinking in that way. But sometimes those folks are open to finding some of those bridges. Mm -hmm. I'd like to ask a question of everyone as well, too, in terms of there's there's so much, no, I wouldn't say so much, there is a fair bit happening right now in policy from the adult side with, for example, Bill C-22 coming out um, in, in mid-development, but also there are definitely organizations that have found their spaces as well, too. I think Brenda Lanahan is in our audience there today as well, who works with the kids side of uh, disability without poverty, you know, things like that. How, would you value a space to learn more about these things? Uh, what would that look like to you? What would uh, be important in that? Uh, you can also connect with me on Twitter or on my email as well too. And if you have some thoughts or insights, I'd be more than happy to hear them as well. And I wonder if I may uh, make a very uh, open recruitment call for us. So we are uh, on Child Bright on this. Uh, so Child Bright is this network of uh, research uh, and researchers and uh, patient oriented strategic research, if you want. But I, I don't nobody really likes the word patient here. But um, we are we are forming now uh, what we're calling the policy hub which is essentially a group uh, of families, decision makers at different levels that we are trying to bring together to discuss exactly what would be important policy directions to take. So if anyone is interested in knowing more, like, or what are messages that we can and should tailor to policy in relation to children with disabilities in Canada, uh, please do email me. You see my email there and be happy to, uh, we are forming the advisory group now. So we'll be happy to uh, have anyone interested engaged. So this is one, <laughs> one space um, that I want to put up there, but for sure on, uh, on following up on the chat conversations, I think we do have so much to learn um, from each other on how to do for sure. The stories uh, illustrate, right? Like they give life, the story that Rachel, Toad and like uh, we had Leon. Uh, if we have time, we can put the video or we can send to you. Like uh, at the UN speaking to like to his rights and how and, and this really gets uh, makes it real, right? For people who are far from the kitchen table, as you said, on the on the chat, like uh, to remember, okay, what's what's the context of this? What's beyond papers and uh, beautiful planning and definitions? Because most of policies are nice right in nature like when you read policy documents they look comprehensive they talk about all those things but it's hard to get to the nitty-gritty of like okay how that looks like in real life and that what we can um bring together right so any other ideas or thoughts on how we can do that are um and how we can put our brains together towards that would be great well, thank you so much to Keiko and Brittany and Jen for such an enlightening conversation. Um, I I could talk to no end about this as well too, and it's um, it's just nice to be able to share this to a broader audience. And I look forward to sharing this on social media as well too. As I mentioned, this will be on our YouTube channel as well. And uh,